It's that button. And it is Caracon Carne, still in quarantine. I'm James Van Osdell. Uh, before we begin tonight's show, I just heard this right before the show started. Uh, I just learned of the passing of Mike McBeardo McPadden, who, what a tremendous writer this guy was. What a tremendous person he was, a mega talent. Uh, this book right here, especially heavy metal movies, I, this is one of those books. It's, I, I told him once it's a great bathroom book. And he said it was the highest honor I, I could possibly get. Because <laughs> it's the kind of book you could pick up at any time in the bathroom, turn to any page and be entertained. This dude knew so much about cinema, about metal, about rock. Uh, he was such a great guest. I had him on WGN when I did my talk show there uh, probably five or six times. He was on Carcon Carne a couple times, episode 100, 224. Just a really talented dude. You can honor him by reading his books, finding his writing on the web. Just a wonderful dude. I, my condolences to his friends and family and fans, and they are legion. So Mike McBeardo, McPadden. And with that, I, I'm going to transition. I, I think we all need some positive stories tonight. In, in general, in 2020, we all need positive stories. And on that note, my guest is Lanny Cordola. He is the man behind the miraculous Love Kids. Lanny, good evening. Good evening, my friend. First, thank you. But let's raise a little toast for, for Mike and forever may he roam with those uh, beings uh, in the higher realms and his spirit uh, Cheers. You know, continues to spread its goodwill. So I love that. Let's talk. I don't think... I think it bears explanation what the Miraculous Love Kids is. So I guess turn it into an elevator pitch. What, what, is, what are you doing? <laughs> my, my pitch. I, I am a pitch man for the Miraculous Love Kids. Uh, I, it's, yeah. So essentially, um, after all my journeys through the, uh, the music world, which encompassed uh, working with, uh, you know, Gene Simmons from KISS and, you know, the guys in Guns N' Roses and Nancy Sinatra and uh, the Beach Boys. And, and I, we were talking earlier about uh, people like Little Milton. So it was, it was this weird, you know, when you're like, not in a, ba a band, but you know, that you're, you have enough talent to get invited to be part of the proceedings. It was such a great vantage point because when I was a kid, I wanted to be Jimmy Page. I mean, you know, how many well, of sure. us didn't? You know, I saw Zeppelin when I was a kid and I'm like, okay, bingo. I want to do, I want to do it like that guy. And then when I was, when I was a, shortly after I saw, actually, I think before, I don't know if it was before or after I saw Zeppelin, but I saw Van Halen before their album even came out. And I'm like, okay, I, somewhere between those two guys, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to do. So, uh, Wait, you know, no, Andy, I, were, you, were you that kid in school who would like, write the band or draw the band's logos on the back of your spiral notebook were you drawing like i didn't have that much talent james sorry could you even but, like uh, scribble a zoso somewhere or a, a uh, probably okay. probably yeah and 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 i you know i'm a notebook guy so i must have been writing uh you know notes about like different aspects of you know what that meant to me and how i could articulate it at that time so when that didn't pan out when i went to the gene simmons school of rock with house of lords and that didn't pan out i i just was a bit lost for a while and then I just did a bunch of sessions and finally out of that haze I sort of pleaded with whatever spirit there is to uh, allow me to find something that had a deeper soul connection and so I'm really grateful now that I didn't become you know because when I always hear about Jimmy Page and you know, they have all these like gardeners in their mansions and even like with some of the other well-known people I know, it's like they spend so much time with all this stuff. I'm like, wow, man, that's exhausting. So I, I had an opportunity after, um, it was really an epiphany that I had after uh, my grandmother had passed away in 2005. And that was an epic loss for me, although she lived a full life and there's no regrets. And we had a wonderful last night. I was really lost. So in the midst of that, I went to Bulgaria and uh, I became a Bulgarian rock star. I got to, uh, you know, go over there and meet these incredible Bulgarian musicians through a friend. And um, I might have just stayed over there, but my mom was getting married. So I had to come back for that. And I was really depressed, really down and out. And I was listening to a radio station that I never listened to and, you know, driving in a place uh, that I never would drive to. I've driven to and all of a sudden the voice of John Coltrane came on talking about the healing power of music and it was like a light went off that's what I got to do and I'd had this poster of Coltrane in my uh, 
my apartment uh, that I would look at all the time, even when I was sort of out of my mind, you know, um, and I just felt like he was kind of always trying to convey something. It's a blue, blue train is the poster. And I got it when I was on tour with the Beach Boys and with San Francisco. And they thought I was nuts because I'm carrying around this humongous poster of, of Coltrane. But uh, after that, I actually met the Coltrane family and I met people that worked with him. And they just, I just wanted to know, is, was he the real deal? Was this guy, did he really mean this? Did he, when he taught about this, this nexus point, of sound, spirit, and science, you know, creating a higher consciousness and awareness with the right intention and frequency and concentration. And these things just really started resonating with my soul. So fast forward another year, I'm, I was reading, I found a book called Heavy Metal Islam. Well, everyone should read a book called Heavy Metal Islam for just the, just the sheer fact of the title. But uh, <laughs> there was a cover of this Arabic girl with an Iron Maiden shirt. And it was written by a guy, a guy named Mark Levine. And he's a, a Jewish American professor at UC Irvine, who's also a musician. And it's about his travels through all these Muslim countries, Egypt, Pakistan, Lebanon, in all these places. And so I went to go see him speak. And then I went up and introduced myself. And then he, we became fast friends. And then I told him, and he really resonated with the Coltrane, a love supreme idea. From him, he introduced me to a guy named Todd Shea. Todd is another musician with a remarkable story who, um, through a bunch of sequence of events, much like myself, ended up in Pakistan to start a, an organization to help the disenfranchised and the poor over there. And then Todd invited me to come over to collaborate with Pakistani musicians and bring together, you know, some of the people that I knew over here, sort of a cultural, you know, thing. So uh, this was August 2010. I'm flying there. He calls me at the last minute, says, man, sorry, but I got to cancel this because the worst floods in the country's history has just happened. Thousands of people have died and there's millions of displaced and it's a mess. And I said, man, I, I still want to come because I, you know, I'm not coming just for the music. I want to see what's happening, you know, with the uh, and all I knew about Pakistan was all the bad stuff. Right. And this incredible musician named Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan who I'm not sure if you know him, but yep. Jeff Buckley said he was his Elvis. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I had met Peter Gabriel uh, years later, uh, of course, um, you know, basically discovered him and signed him to his real world label and, uh, you know, and, and, and collaborated with him on, on, on several uh, projects. So going over there, um, uh, first thing we did was we went to some of these camps where the people were displaced. And I was so incredibly struck by uh, the warmth of the people, but in particular, the plight of the children <clears throat> and their, their joy in the midst of such incredible hardship. I mean, I was just completely flabbergasted and horrified and captivated by, by this confluence, contradictory feelings. And at that point I said, okay, the music now has gotta be for them. They have to be part of the equation. It can't just be, oh, this famous guy, you know, and this American famous musician and this Pakistani famous musician, they come together and they play for the people that can afford to, you know, go and see this. We actually did one, uh, it was actually really cool. It was a Wayne Kramer, uh, put together um, an event in New York. So uh, the, the one of the most popular singers from uh, Pakistan, a guy named Atif Aslam, who's sort of like the Justin Timberlake or whatever of South Asia. I mean, he's just big, big following all over, not just Pakistan, but he's a Bollywood guy. So it's India, it's Bangladesh, it's Sri Lanka. It's all, all over the place. So we brought him with, uh, you know, basically Guns N' Roses, except Axel. You know, it was Slash, it was Gilby, it was... Uh, Matt Sorum, Duff McKagan, um, you know, myself, and this Pakistani singer. And so that was, that was, that was the, the beginning of, you know, trying to awaken the music community to the plight of, you know, the, the suffering of children. And, you know, that we're talking hundreds of millions of children that live in dire conditions, 20 to 25,000 children die every single day because of poverty and war. 
And so, you know, I, hey, that, that, that's take, heartbreaking stuff. It yeah. Just, it's just, it's, it, it's staggering to hear those numbers. When you think about that, I mean, in 10 days, that's, you know, 200 to 250,000 children. And as bad as this COVID thing has been, I think, I don't know how many people have lost their lives to this now, but you know, the, uh, I, I just want the kid, cause right now the whole bandwidth is either politics and that whole, that whole thing or COVID. And there's, there's a little, little deal for some other odds and ends, you know, and usually it's something tawdry about, you know, Johnny Depp's having problems or so-and-so's having problems or so-and-so's has become a woman or man or things like that, that are fine, but they don't really have a bearing on what's really, really important, you know, uh, in, in the world. And obviously for me, it's kids. So that's how Miraculous Love Kids was initially founded. So then the next level was in 2014, I heard about these two girls, a, a, a nine-year-old girl and her 12-year-old sister. One was named Parwana and one other one was Horsheed. And uh, they, were, they were killed in a suicide bomb attack in Kabul, Afghanistan. And the, the intended target was Western forces, in particular, the Americans. And I, I, there's just something that just awakened another level of spirit. I, I really believe we have an infinite amount of space within that so many of us just never access. We're like these supercomputers and we don't even know how to flip on the switch. And when <laughs> we flip on the switch, you know, we got to know we got to have a manual. And some, you know, sometimes the manual is just tinkering. And that's what it was for me because there is, there is no manual to go to war torn, poverty stricken areas. And this is what you do. It's just, it's just not there. So, um, I, I met a veteran named Brad Pupello who befriended these two sisters. And he told me that those two girls were the bravest girls that he, bravest people, not just girls, but people that he'd ever met, that they literally would sacrifice their lives for you. And they did, they saved their, their, their the lives of the Americans. So I went over to meet that family. And I met the sister that survived that attack. She was eight years old at the time. Her name is Marsal. And they were living in this very poor area, you know, on the outskirts of Kabul in a place called Ashuda. And extremely dangerous place, I found out later. But at that point, I didn't know. So what you don't know, I guess, you know, you just precaution the better. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not always that so much concerned on my end. I kind of have to be now because I'm responsible for hundreds of kids. But, you know, I always feel like I'm supposed to go, I got to see it firsthand. I got to smell it. I got to, you know, you know, take it, you know, the whole scene in and, you know, be able to assess the, what I can do. And I didn't even know I had that. And, and um, so I brought a guitar with me and this girl, Mersal, and a couple of her friends that were part of this little group of kids that would go over in this area and they would just sell scarves. In fact, this is one of the scarves they sell just like this one. Or, you know, little bracelets, like these little bracelets, that's kind of, you know, things. And, and um, so that's what they were doing there when they, when they lost their lives. And so this other group, it was like, it was like four girls and they were just like, Oh, you know, we really, we really want to, you know, can we learn this guitar? And I'm like, you really, you guys will. And so uh, I came back, I thought about it. And then, um, you know, I had already thought about Miraculous Love Kids um, as, as, as sort of a rock and roll UNICEF or a rock and roll Save the Children, but without all of the bureaucracy. I want to be able to, because I met with Save the Children, UNICEF, and God bless them, and they do a lot of good work. But I wanted to be ground floor on the streets, see what's happening firsthand. And they don't do that, you know, in, in these. That, these that's what you hear about a lot of the larger size charities. It, such a large percentage of what they take in goes to operational costs. Well, yes. And, um, you know, I could go on, but I, I you know, I, 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 you know, every, everything, I guess, has their, their place and whatnot. But that wasn't for me. I'm not a report writer. Uh, I'm not from that world. I'm not an NGO guy, you know, and, and I'm a rock and roll guy uh, who just wanted to start using his life and music for something that felt, you know, deeper within the soul. And I want to I want to pivot from there because you, that's the second time you've said it. And it's interesting to me because I'm at a point and I've said this before on this podcast. I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, shit, I need to do more. I need to do more good things for more people like I. Had my fun when I was younger. What can I do now to be more 
responsible in the universe. I mean, I, it is something I, I think about a lot, and it sounds like you hit a similar point. Yeah. Can you? With I don't want to date you at all, Lanny, but like, at what age did this hit you? Uh, I, it's been a sl- it's been a slow journey, but I always felt, even when I was a kid, I was supposed to do something that was beyond myself, my comfort zone, and my own little circle. But when it really hit, it was about that 2006 epiphany, and I was 46 at that time. So, um, you know, but I like, it's like that Dylan song, you know, I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. And uh, I'll be celebrating my uh, uh, 60th birthday next Thursday. And and, uh, we've been raising funds, you know, to, you know, commemorate that. And, um, uh, you know, to help uh, with the kids. And um, so, you know, you know, it, it really is. It's, it's just, um, you know, my grandmother who lived to be 85, but she always said, it's not age, it's, it's state of mind and state of health. 100% so, agree. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, unfortunately rock and roll gets so obsessed with, um, the age thing, but I mean, geez, look at Mick Jagger out there and they're still, you know, and Keith, they're still doing their thing. And Steven Tyler and all these, these guys are, you know, going out there and, and uh, I mean, look at what David Attenborough, I mean, he's not a rock and roll guy, but it kind of isn't with the way he does yeah. his nature thing. And he's 94 years old. And so, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright did some of his best work when he was in his eighties and nineties. So to me, it's like when you start thinking that way, and this is even, there's a book, by Bruce Lipton called the biology of belief. When you start saying, oh yeah, I'm an old guy and this, that, your body starts believing it. Sure, so, yeah. you know, I don't sit there and say, oh, I'm a young guy. I just, I'm just saying, I'm a, I'm a, a multidimensional being like all of us having this experience right now that's so much greater than just what we think we see because we get distracted by so much um, stuff that just really doesn't enrich us and that those deeper layers. And, um, you know, like Dostoyevsky said, you know, man is a mystery and I'm going to live, I'm going to, you know, um, my whole life will be able to dis- discover as much as that mystery as I can. And <clears throat> so I feel that same way. And um, so, uh, you know, after I made the commitment to uh, do this, I wanted to start, when I started really finding out about the plight of girls, Girls' rights are basically non-existent. They're forced into childhood marriages, prostitution, you know, pedophilia, all of these horrible things. Um, and I wanted to use music as a vehicle to shine a light on this. So we started Girl With A Guitar. And in 2018, we got to do a song with Brian Wilson, Love and Mercy. And of course, you know, that's... Um, <laughs> I know their very first song. They don't have any idea right. who Brian Wilson is. So, you know, if um, Chris Cornell and David Bowie and, and Prince all came down on a spaceship and landed, you know, in our studio, the kids would have no clue who they are. Um, I mean, you know, if Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley and Keith and, and Mick and, you know, Jimmy Page all came, no clue who any of these guys are. They, 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 I mean, they have an idea of some of the names, but sure. like, you know, cause we started working on, I don't call it a curriculum or, or even a school, really. I call it, you know, we're like a group and we have a set list. And so I wanted it to, cause some people were going, oh, miraculous love kids. That sounds like a band. And I said, exactly. I want to have the biggest rock and roll band in the history of humanity where everybody's invited who wants, who comes along with that same spirit. I love that. And from the perspective of a Brian Wilson or a star at that level, it's probably helpful that there is no association with the name. It probably helps it, it is. these musicians let their guard down and really focus on the moment and not have to be Brian Wilson, pop rock legend. Just... <laughs> well, Brian is very interesting. Um, he actually is really not much, he's not an activist. I mean, he's, you know, very eccentric and has had obviously some, he's a survivor. I mean, the guy I think is going to be 80 next year. And, and, and I've had a Beach Boy connections, but as you probably know, the Beach Boy have a schism between the Mike Love and there's actually more Beach Boys in Brian Wilson's group than there are in the Beach Boys. But um, a friend of mine plays with Brian and I asked him, his name is Gary Griffin and he's a, one of the best musicians I know and he plays keyboards in Brian's band <clears throat> and I said would you ask Brian 
if he would do this. And he's like, oh man, I mean, I'll do anything for the kids and you, but Brian just doesn't do this stuff. So I go, okay, uh, what about his wife? And he goes, oh, Melinda might be into that. He, wrote, he writes her an email and he goes, he calls me up immediately and says, you're not, this is a Monday. You're not going to believe this. Well, Linda says, pick Brian up at noon on Thursday. So it, it literally just, just like that, boom, it was deemed. And he, he gets to, we pick him up. He's in Beverly Hills, the studios in the Valley in, in Southern California. And uh, he's like, oh, so what are we doing? And I tell him and he's like, oh, wow, far out, man. He, he was, he was just, you know, completely. Far out, man. You know, exactly. And I was asking him how he wrote Love and Mercy. And he said, oh, I was in Malibu with some champagne. And I said, well, you know, the, the, the girls are all Muslim girls. And they said to tell Mr. Brian Wilson that he's written this beautiful Muslim prayer because one of the sayings in Islam is Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which means, you know, in the name of the God of love and mercy. So that blew his mind. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of, uh, uh, but he's, he's very much in tune with, and, and I think most songwriters are, and I've had the good fortune to, you know, um, share some time with, you know, people like Steve Perry and Nick Cave and Tom Morello and some of these guys. And um, it is, we all are mystified by you know it i mean obviously it's something you have to work at and you study and you go why does this sound cool here and and whatnot and and you you know the songs that i, I basically do two kinds of music that that music that i love and that music that i think is important and unfortunately the ones that are important i don't necessarily love because they're 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 dark and but they're important because they, they need to shed light on what's happening with, you know, uh, the world and, and suffering humanity and all that. And, you know, a song has a way to convey a story that can move someone without traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. And I learned that through the kids, because when we started getting together, um, I would tell them, you know, like uh, what was happening, say, in Yemen. And I'd bring a photo in. In particular, there was this little girl and her name was Allah, and she was just near the end. And she, they, she basically starved to death. And they were very sad, but they said, we are going to be the voice for Allah. A-L-A-A -A -A is how you spell her name. And so we wrote a song about Allah. And so they started, every time something like that would happen, we would use music as a vehicle to express the sorrow, but to keep their, their you know, spirit you know, with us. So they're part of Miraculous Love Kids, even though they're no longer in this world with us, they are with us. And we carry all of those girls, including the two that were killed, Parwana Khorshid. We lost another girl named Malika to an explosion three years ago. Um, we lost one of our boys just a month ago, and all of it because of poverty and war. And so, you know, that was my thinking. I go, how can myself in the place that I'm in now, because I had really no commitments and no ties. And I, you know, got rid of most everything I had. How can we live in a world where we sacrifice these beautiful children to the altar mm -hmm. of poverty and war, when those children, if they had the opportunity, could be the one that discovers a cure for cancer, or diabetes, or all, you know, all of these different things that afflict humanity. Um, it's such a, it's just such a waste of um, human potential and it's so unfair and, and, and unjust. So, you know, that's, um, you know, one of our um, things that we, we learned because at first I'm going, okay, is this going to make them feel worse or is this going to empower them? So it empowers them because these kids are so poor. They're working on the street. They've, you know, got lost family members to drug. I mean, Afghanistan is a massive drug problem. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has so many problems. It's one of the most corrupt countries in the world and yet at the same time there is some of the most beautiful kind-hearted people you would ever meet it is a, truly a country of extremes and so I've just fallen under its spell and um, so that's when we decide I, I, we, we have miraculous love kids girl with a guitar and I just love the the sound of that and you know and at some point we'll have and boys too in parentheses because we're not trying to discriminate but and but you know nine-year-old girls aren't being or nine-year-old boys aren't being married off to 60-year-old women and that's that's happening in in these regions so well, yeah, uh, the yeah, girl let's talk about that for a second you talked about how precarious it is for girls mm. in this situation how just the odds are stacked against them 
as far as your your what you're doing it goes teaching these girls guitar bringing some western culture to afghanistan does that put you at risk well i mean everybody's at risk there i mean literally everybody's at risk because these people do not care about human life uh, these people don't even know anything about islam uh, that are doing this, uh, whether it's Taliban, Daesh, Haqqani Network, whether it's the criminal syndicates, they have no reverence or respect for anything except for being in power. And, you know, that's the hard truth that I learned. So, you know, I stick out a little more, obviously, because I, you know, I look uh, different. And of course, I'm working with girls, but we, you know, we don't, I don't do media over there anymore. When I first got there, you know, I had, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, everything's going to, we're going to just you know, get this thing and people are going to come falling along. And yeah, we, we did like the, it's a, it was called Afghan star. And we did it with like the Lady Gaga of uh, Afghanistan. And of course the, the fundamentalists and Taliban people, you know, despise her. And so, um, you know, the parents came to me and said, please, you know, we totally trust you, but this is just putting our kids and you uh, in jeopardy. So at that point, I just, we decided, you know, we don't do, and some of them try to trick us too. Some of these want to get a story, you know, on the, on the local TV there and whatnot. So I have to be very discerning in, in what we do. We do Western media because most of them, uh, you know, aren't, they, are, are uneducated and, and they don't speak English and they, you know, they don't, you know, uh, wouldn't be able to find say for your show or the BBC or Eddie trunk or any of the other things that, you know, we've done. So that's been actually, you know, um, a, you know, very positive thing because the message has to get out. People need to know uh, the music community needs to do more. And um, so, but I, I, I just feel you know, um, it's very tricky because kids are kids and they like to be lazy sometimes. And I'm trying to instill in them a discipline, which is practicing and, you know, being responsible, but it's a war zone. So sometimes, you know, they, well, when I first was there, they were always sick and they were always sick, A, because of the stress, B, because their diets were terrible. Mm -hmm. And so between those two things, you know, the stress is lower because all of the kids we give a stipend to. So, you know, how cool is that? They come and learn English and guitar and they get paid. I'm like, they have no clue. I said, I used to, I used to make a lot of money doing this. And now, you know, so, uh, but it, it's a great privilege to do it because, you know, Tamina, who's one of our girls who I met when she was 14, met her on the street. She was just, just kind of, you know, street kid. And she's coming up to, you know, they come and they try to sell you pens and they just use it as props usually. So you can just give them some, a little bit of money and whatever. Yeah. Well, she's now my assistant and I've taught her English and she's, and she, you know, her father's also my assistant and it's just, it's really, you know, worked out so wonderful to see. And now she wants to work for Miraculous Love Kids when she finishes school and she sees that she can be a help. She can, um, you know, and she's, you know, we've been in the studio. She's learning about that. She's very, um, you know, responsible. And so, um, so she's a big help with with the smaller ones because we've got kids as young as five and then she's the oldest you know at 18 and um so that is really a, an exciting new phase for us uh you know with with her uh and then you know watching some of the other girls unfortunately we've lost some because uh it's just you you know there's some of them are so traumatized and broken it's just difficult to um you know and i have no legal authority so i i've got right lawyers over there. I've got good helpers. I know people in the military and, but, but the police are extremely corrupt. So if something happens, you, 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 the police is the last resort, you know? So you, you, I've got advisors and people, mostly Afghans. I got Western friends over there, but they think with a Western mind and you can't think with a Western mind because it's a whole different set of dynamics. But you know, I tell you, you know, when I when I first went there, February 2016, so it'll be five years, and that's when I said, okay, I'm moving out of LA, and you know, we're gonna, we're going to do this, you know, or we're going to try, you know, we'll see what happens. And so I didn't know what I was doing. I was just floundering about. They'd come in, and I'd be like, you know, uh, okay, what are we going to do? Okay, let's do Bob Marley. Don't worry about. <laughs> you know, every little, you know, and so, so we would just sort of. So it was more just about being present you know, let them sort of acclimate to this new environment because there's nothing like that 
And, you know, I mean, it's amazing a country of 36 million people. They don't have a rock and roll band. They have very little outlets for these kind of creative things. They have one institution over there called the Afghan National Institute of Music that gets a lot of funding and whatnot, but they teach more folk and classical music. And we're doing songs and, you know, um, that are telling you know, that relate to their condition, but also the human condition at large, but it's very chronic over there for them. So anyway, it was April 19th and the nine o'clock hour and the whole building just shook. And I knew what had happened. That was an, it was an explosion. And it was at that point, it's like, okay, am I going to leave or am I going to double down and we're going to really do something here? Because this, this isn't going to get attention to anybody just playing these kind of songs. So um, uh, it was at that point that the song Fragile by Sting popped into my mind, because at that point, there was 50 people that ended up losing their lives, hundreds of them seriously injured and thousands affected from their family members and friends um, from this one uh, um, explosion. And of course, I was keeping it. I have a thing called the Explosion Chronicles. And I every time there was one, I would write about it, the time, the place, the feelings. I'd go to the place myself, see what we could do. Some of the kids actually joined our group that, you know, lost loved ones in it or raise money for them or help them, you know, in some way just to, to um, let them know that there was someone that cared and that was in solidarity with all of that. So I didn't think fragile through. I mean, oh gosh, it's easy. It's only E minor, E minor, B7. They can do that. No problem. Well, for us, blood will flow, flesh and steel are one drying in the color of the evening sun. Tomorrow's rain will wash the pain away, but something in our mind will always stay. Well, for an Afghan kid that doesn't speak any English, this is very complicated, but they learned it, you know? And, and at first it was just like, I didn't really care if they had all I cared about is they could play in time and get something out of their mouth. It didn't matter to me if it was the exact words or the right melody or anything. So we'd go play at, you know, uh, the Canadian embassy and the Australian embassy. And, and of course, everybody loved it because, you know, it's here's this, you know, you know, crazy American guy with these, you know, 10 Afghan girls playing, you know, these uh, Western songs. But we, we ended up playing for the first lady. Uh, of uh, the you know the president's wife at the presidential palace and the girls did great I mean they they always were very poised and uh and I was always the one like nervous you know because sure. you know I'm kind of like I, the, you know why yeah. wouldn't you be uh, of course you were <laughs> so so the, the first lady was really cool and she came up to the girls and she said you know you girls play really good guitar but you really need to work on your singing and then when we got back, they're like, how dare she say that about us? Our singing is great. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> you're singing, you know, um, you know, uh, so now, so we need to listen to what she said. And then we started working on the vocals and it's, it's quantum. It's a quantum shift. I mean, it's actually pleasant to listen to now. I mean, they still got a ways to go. They're not by any means professionals. It's really difficult because of all of the obstacles that, that go on. It's not like over here where you can have a set schedule and pretty much you follow right. that schedule. There's, it's, it's just, you can't have a set schedule because if anyone's watching you, they watch for patterns. So you got to mix it up all the time and you got to do different days and different times. And sometimes you got to take a week off and and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it, uh, you know, they're, they're years behind what they would be if they were, you know, over here. And of course, when I'm gone, you know, um, they're, uh, they, they're, there's no one there to take over, you know, although they go into little pods and practice on their own now a little bit more. But, um, but you know, the, doing the, 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 the Love and Mercy, which was um, after we learned Fragile by Sting, we learned Love and Mercy um, by, uh, by Brian Wilson. And then we actually went to, we got into a recording studio and they just did amazing. I mean, I guess they just didn't have any clue of what it's the fear of it. I mean, I think, you know, That's so it. often, you know, over here, we judge each other so much that we're so, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, so much is on ego rather than essence. And so I, I just watching them, my like, God, how guys aren't nervous. Cause I'm, 
really nervous. And they're like, well, why? Why would you be nervous? What's it's the word for, uh, for, for fear, being afraid is called Tarsendok. You know, so why, why need, you know, uh, you know, why aren't you afraid? And uh, they're like, why, why, why? What's there to be afraid of? We love playing guitar. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so I learned that from them, you know, this fearlessness. And then um, we started working on, God, we, we, we do Red Rain by Peter Gabriel. We're doing God Break Down the Door by Got Nine Inch Nails. Uh, we're doing, uh, um, we're doing uh, get up, stand up. So we're doing a Bob Marley song, but you know, and they learn about their rights through that. We're doing in the name of love by you too. So they're learning about, you know, uh, Martin Luther King and civil rights and, and you know, and all of that. Um, and then of course uh, we, we came to sweet dreams and a friend before of mine, before we talk about that, cause I, yeah. I, I want to get into the video. I, I, I want to ask, you've seen so much, you've been around, tragedy and I, I, there's nothing that hits harder i think than seeing kids in peril kids being hurt it it, it, it stops you in your tracks yeah. you hear stories about first responders and seeing the horrors they see how they they have to do something for self-care they need to take care of themselves to kind of reconcile the horrors they see with their lives i mean are you taking care of yourself landy because you've probably seen a lot of a lot of shit that a lot of us <laughs> are, are, aren't equipped to take or equipped to handle emotionally. Are you okay? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I was a mess before I started this because I kept having this voice telling me, who do you think you are? Oh, you're the savior of the world now. And I literally for one year, I couldn't sleep. I mean, I was just a complete, uh, it was like my old self and my new self battling it out. And, you know, you know, and when I finally went over there that first year, I was sick because I'm completely in shock. It's one of the worst air qualities in the world. And so I was sick all the time. But then I start you start adapting and you start figuring out creative ways of accessing those inner technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it ebbs and flows and, you know, so yeah, when I, this last trip was tough, there was some things that happened with some of the, the kids and their families. And that's, that's difficult to take. And, um, I've got some good friends over there, but you know, there's only, they, they have, they have their things that they're doing. And so, um, you know, I'm responsible for the kids, but you know, it's agonized. Well, and now it's so difficult because now you got to like, you got to do this kind of obstacle course of getting the PCR test at 96 hours before the flight. And then you got to make sure you got a room in the, 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 the Dubai airport, because if you go outside, they do another test. And if you happen to test positive, even if you're not sick, you're quarantined for 14 days. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tricky dance. So trying to get, you know, going over there, man, I'm on fire because I'm, re I'm rejuvenated, but coming back, I am like, a, I am, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty toasted. So, you know, I come back to the, to, you know, LA to the beach and I uh, just, uh, you know, take a week, see my mom and just take, you know, walk on the beach and just let the beach and, you know, the calmness uh, do its thing. And it does, it's, it's like clockwork. And so I kind of, I have a system and then, you know, like I go out and do these little trips and, um, you know, it's sort of almost reconnaissance because whatever I feel like, oh, this will be a great place to take the girls because that's our plan is to get them over here. Um, we, you know, we were going to have them come over next year, but I don't know if that's going to be possible now. So um, in the meantime, you know, I'm, I, I'm writing a book about it and, you know, getting, you know, trying to compile footage at some point if someone wants to, uh, you know, do something because these, these kids are remarkable. You know, Tom Morello... I haven't actually met Tom in person, but we've exchanged, you know, incredible soul filled emails and Tom actually thanked me for allowing him the privilege. This are his words of playing with these brave girls. So here I am, I got tears coming down my cheeks because these are like my daughters and for him to say, thank you for allowing me to do this. I, that's when I knew it's like, man, we're, 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 we're the, the, the kids are onto something, you know? And so that's, they don't, they don't, but they still don't, they don't know. And how could they, because, you know, they're, they still all live in difficult places. I mean, the, the, the none of the fathers work because there's no jobs there. It's like 60 yeah. to 70% joblessness. So the, so the, so the girls are the breadwinner. 
So this girl, Tom and I was telling you about, she makes 400 a month, which is like low middle-class wages. 500 is like, you know, five, five like 600 is like middle-class, you know, and 800 is like upper class. And then you're making a thousand, you know, you're, 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 you're riding high. So she's got a family. I think, I think of there's eight of them. So she supports the family of eight with her salary. And um, so, uh, you know, um, yeah, man. I mean, it's just, uh, um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I do my best, man. I have to be responsible for them and to people that care, you know? And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I do take it seriously as much as I can. And, you know, it's great being out on the beach, getting some exercise, communing with the seabirds. And I you know, <laughs> sit out there and, you know, write and, and ideas come, I got my notepad. And, and it's really, it's, it's really that mystical because I'll be trying to crack, you know, a riddle, you know, like, okay, we got this thing, what's gonna happen with it, you know? And I'll get like, just today, I mean, this is, this was, I, I, I actually met Little Kids Rock, David Wish, an amazing guy today. And he, they, we're going to work with them. And I just met the, uh, Randy over at the Alice Cooper Foundation. They're in, or Alice has this wonderful, um, you know, program for kids in, in, in the Phoenix area. So we're all going to work on collaborating on something. And then, you know, when I'm over there, uh, I've got, you know, after I'm done with the kids, I got time to work on some different things. And so and Nick Cave is someone who's I, someone I greatly admire. I, How so, can you not? How can you not? So many levels. And uh, he, his red hand letters, or red hand files, or what are, what are they? Yeah, red hand files, I think. But he, I don't know if you, if you subscribe to it, but if you don't, you and your, your listeners should, because they're absolutely phenomenal. People ask questions, and he uses it as sort of a portal to reflect and ruminate about, you know, different um, life, uh, you know, philosophies and, and whatnot. In one of them, he put these words in. It's called Where the World and She Are Breathless Beautiful. And I broke into tears because we lost one of our girls. And, um, and this was to me, this, he wrote this for his wife, Nick did. And this was about this girl that I adopted and that I lost. Um, and and basically the song is about, you know, you, you do everything that you can to, you know, guide them in the right way and, and, and lead them to, you know, that, that path of, you know, light and wisdom. And, and at some point, you know, the confluence of forces may take them away. And, and, and so this, this song is about how you can create that transcendent sacred space in your heart and in, in the song. <clears throat> and so, you know, where the world and she are breathless, beautiful. So it just, it was like a snap of a finger, boom, like this, I put it on my garage band. And then I went in with the, you know, some of the girls and I played it for them and they were practicing the guitar and, and then they come in singing on the end. So make a long story short, I'm sorry, but basically Nick heard it and wrote me today and I am, I'm on cloud nine because he just spoke so lovingly about it. He said that he tried to find the right melody for this song and that, you know, I, I had found it. And cause I, you know, wanted to get his blessing before we would release it or anything. So, you know, that was one of those, you know, magical days, you know, of the little kids rock people and getting this incredible note from Nick Cave. And those, and then, you know, talking to, you know, beautiful souls like yourself who are, you know, I mean, you're, you're reaching a lot of people and you move people that you, you, you know, probably don't even know most of them uh, by what I can just tell by your spirit and your, your listening and your attention and your love of, you know, music and life and all the different layers of it. So, you know, um, and you know, you all, you get those days where it's just like, Wow. And then we got a, a donation today from somebody that it was the biggest donation we, we, we'd gotten. And I didn't even know what to do. I was like in such a state of like, I mean, like, I don't, it's hard to describe what it is. It's just like, it's, it's beyond joy. It's, it's, it's just like so humbling that, you know, it, you know, things start coming together like that and people care. 
And I know sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but people, there's a lot of people that really do care. It is nice to get those reminders, isn't it? It is. It, it, I feel like we could all use more of those. And that, that's awesome. I just went over to Supermex to get my, and they got a great little salad over there. And I'm, you know, and I, and I, and I come into the room I'm staying and I meet this guy and he's from Bangladesh and I go, man, I was on my way to Bangladesh, you know, and the, and COVID shut it down. He's like, Oh my God, man, all right, what are you doing? And I brought, showed him a flyer of our thing. And he goes, Oh man, all right, I'm giving you this discount and I'm going to give you a, you know, like a, a window view of the ocean, you know? And that's what I always tell the kids do the right thing. The right things will happen, which is kind of an odd thing to say to war torn kids because, you know, they haven't done anything wrong, but it's just a philosophy to get into your mind to when you're challenged, don't respond to that something negative with something negative, which is a lot easier said than done because I've, whew, I've been tested. And, um, I think I've, uh, I think I've gotten through those ones so far. So it's like, you know, what, 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 what next can, can happen. But, uh, but anyway, so I go to the supermax and they, you know, they're there and I go, Hola, amigos, como esta, you know, and they're like, Oh, como esta, amigo? you know, and it's just a beautiful little exchange of energy. I know very little Spanish, but, and, but they appreciated it. And, you know, and you can lift someone up right in your own backyard and guess what? It lifts you up too. 100%. So it just, it's just, you know, an, an, an energy that we all possess. I think we all possess. Oh, there's some. There's some of these dark souls that I that I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, but I, I'd like to believe if the right opportunities arise or is, is arisen, there are some people that state that X amount of us are psychopaths and sociopaths. I don't know, um, but I do know that um, you know there are a lot more of the good ones than the other ones. There's no doubt. I, com I completely agree. All right. So you, you talked about Tom Morello. You talked about working with him. Let's let's get into this stunning video of oh. Sweet Dreams, the Eurythmic song. Uh, let's I, I guess let's start with the guest. First of all, Morello's in there. The second you hear just two two notes played on his guitar, you know it's him playing. You do. I mean, he is just one of those distinct, definitive players of the past fifty years. He just what a talent. What a dude. And what yeah. a socially conscious role model, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, so the initial impetus came because it's difficult. I'm starting to get a little bit of a groove now, and there's a there's a production company over there, but um, you know, I, I keep I, I keep feel guilty, keep asking them for all these favors because um, you know they're a working company. But I said, I go at some point, you guys, man, someone's going to support this, and you know, we'll we'll, we'll you know we'll, we'll figure something out here. But like, oh, don't worry about it, man. We appreciate what you do, and and all that kind of stuff. So, in other words, by the time you teach the kids a song, you get in the studio, and because we record here, then I go to Pakistan because I've got a really great partner over there who uh, is a world-class engineer, world-class musician. And, and so we mix everything and, you know, get that all together. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, it can, it can take, you know, months to, you know, get a song done. Um, so I'm trying to figure out ways to, you know, expedite it a little bit, but, you know, everything in its right place as the great Tom York says, but um, uh, so, our friends said, you know, look at, I know Annie Lennox, do, do a, an Annie Lennox song and, and I'll get it to her. And I, and I know she'll do it. So I go, cool. So I go, well, we got to do sweet dreams. So um, months and months go by. The friend is like, Annie's not responding to me. And I'm like, okay, that means Annie's not supposed to do it. So do you mind if we move on? And, and cause I had this idea that we had to do the song with the artist. Like we did love and mercy mm -hmm. with Brian Wilson. We're going to do fragile with sting, which I still hope we, we do. We're, we're holding out on that because the girls really want to do it with Mr. Sting as they call him. But <laughs> anyway, so the first person that came, by the way, Lenny, I think the girls in the, in America call him Mr. Sting as well. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> but they, they, uh, the first person to come on board was Inara George who's a singer from the bird and the bee. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but uh, very good banding. Her partner, Greg Kirsten, of course, is the legendary producer, Adele and Pink and Foo Fighters and all that kind of stuff. So she came on board and then nothing. And then I'm like, okay, okay. So I got a, there's a riddle here. There's a puzzle. I got to solve it. Okay. Who do I go to next? Wayne Kramer popped into my head. So I wrote to Wayne, Wayne, you know, would you do this? And then Wayne said, 
yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. And then I and reached- for, for people who don't know, Wayne Kramer, MC5, I mean, right. just icon. Icon, uh, you know, a musician's musician. Yes. So after Wayne came on, then I reached out to Vicki Peterson, who, uh, whose husband that I know, John Calsill, who plays drums in the Beach Boys and was in a 60s group called the Calsills. And Vicki said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in too. I said, okay, all right. Who can we, okay, we got to go, we got a bangle now. So how about a yeah, go -go? I was going to say for reference, Vicki Peterson from the bangles. That's right. Yeah. And so then, okay, now we need a go-go. I know Kathy Valentine, but I don't know how to get a hold of her. So I reach out to some friends. They know someone who knows someone. Kathy's like, yes, I'm in. And then I get a call from my friend, Cherie Curry, who's from the Runaways. She's like, because I worked on this at her last album. I don't know if you've heard it, but it's with, uh, I think Slash is on it. Billy Corgan's on it. It's a really cool album. And I wrote, I wrote a song for her on it. And she said, would you come up and we're doing a video? And I said, well, yeah, of course. And oh, by the way, and I could tell she wasn't all that into it at first. Um, now she's our, our biggest supporter and, and loves it, you know. But um, so, so there we had a runaway, we had a bangle, we got a go-go. All right, what else we got going here? So the drummer, Chris Myers, who's from a band called Humphreys McGee, a Chicago guy. Absolutely. A wonderful band, wonderful drummer, and a wonderful guy. He said, man, you're not going to believe it, but I, I, ran, I ran into Tom Morello, and I told him about you, and, and, he's, and he's interested in doing something. I said, well, okay, well, hey, we got this song, and we got these people. He goes, oh, my God, really? All those people are on it? He goes, okay, let me do a drum track. Great. You can do the drum track. We got all these people on it. And then Tom was just like, the next day, Tom's tracks came in. Boom, just like that. So, and then another friend of mine says, hey man, I, um, I know Rami Jaffe from Foo Fighters. You want me to ask him? And I'm like, um, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> so so it, that was like the riddle that was solved just by, you know, um, really, I think, I think Wayne was probably the, Wayne Kramer, MC5, was the one because I think Tom and Wayne are friends and so then Tom made Tom comfortable and if he, he liked the cause, but he didn't know us. Now he knows us. So, you know, we've got a relate, great relationship with all these guys. So it just, you know, it really turned out. So please, your listeners go to YouTube and, and watch Sweet Dreams by the Miraculous Love Kids. And if you're feeling the spirit, you can go to our website, Miraculous Love Kids dot org and give one dollar or a thousand dollars or whatever you can afford it all goes to the kids uh and it goes to our in our our facility and and, and all that i don't take a salary uh I, I want it to be grassroots help as many kids as we can to continue to uh you know belong to a group that is about music and peace and love and a, and a higher way of being and living and I believe that's the new rock and roll is that we're going to be not taking and living like heathen, heathens, but we're going to be giving and living like angels or something, you know, or you know, I like love the, that you know, said the angels of pure future, you know, <laughs> and, and saying, angels of our nature, you know, staying on sweet dreams just for one more second. I do. Before we even talked, I, I appreciated the fact that you had Kathy Valentine, that you had Sherry, that you had um, Vicki Peterson. These are strong women in music and as yeah. you're working with these girls in afghanistan and pakistan I, I think it's important to see like look what they can do these, yeah. these are these are strong powerful super talented women and they're 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 playing instruments and they're doing just what you're learning to do now i thought that was a cool example well you know thank you and, and that was um definitely by design but but you know also Jelly Bean, who is one of our girls, and she's 15 now, and she's really quite, she's really picked up guitar really uh, amazingly. And she doesn't really know who Tom is. And, you know, um, but her first video, she's sharing the screen with Tom Morello. I, so I have, this, I have this right next to my desk, by the way. Just, yes, there you go. So, you know, the mighty Tom, we're, oh, yes. we're actually doing a Tom Morello song as Night Watchman song we've adapted. And so we're working on that. We're just looking for some special guests on that one. It's called God Help Us All. Beautiful, beautiful song. And um, we're, we're finishing up Fly Like an Eagle with Sammy Hagar. 
we're waiting for Chad Kruger from Nickelback to send his uh, uh, parts in. And then we've got Red Rain in the pipeline. And, uh, and then when I go back, we'll work on this new Bruce Springsteen song. It's so cool. It's called House of a Thousand Guitars. And when I played it for them, they're like, oh, Mr. Lanny, that's, that's our song. You know, and I'm like, well, Mr. Bruce might disagree, but, you know, we, we can do a version. And um, so we're, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to work, we're going to work that one up and uh, in the name of love and, um, you know, and just try to engage more of these artists and, and you know, and spread the word more about, um, you know, their plight and the plight of kids, you know, all over that region, the plight of kids here in America, too. I mean, we were talking today with the little kids rock and, you um, you know, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't hurt to be a child anywhere. And there's, there's hurting kids here. And so sure. that's why, you know, when I met David and Randy from Little Kids Rock and Alice Cooper Foundation, we were all, you know, on the same wavelength. You know, they're doing stuff with kids. One's, one's very local to Phoenix. One's pretty much about America. They've got a chapter in Haiti and a, and a chapter in Guatemala. And, you know, we're right now, we're in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kurdistan, Pakistan. And then, you know, when I, as soon as possible, I, I mean, for some reason, I know why, why those places, but it's just, I, I, I just felt like those are the ones um, that were the most vulnerable. You know, it's not a contest of who's suffering more because that's, uh, you know, immeasurable, but I felt like, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot that can be done here and I'm opening, I'm open to doing it. I said, look at you guys to tell me where to go. I'll fly my, I'll pay for my own ticket to go to Haiti or Guatemala uh, if I can help some kids over there and whatnot. Cause when I went to Iraq in 2018, after ISIS was taken out in 2017, I had never seen a demolished city before Mosul. I mean, it was demolished. I mean, it, and, and I had met some kids out there and they were just like starved. They're like, their families are coming out. Cause I raise when I, when I go on these trips I, uh, across the different regions, I raise some money so they can have direct help. You know, it's like $30 will pay their rent for one month in some of these places. <laughs> it's, it's interesting before we started recording tonight, I talked a little bit about your, your music career before this. And you've done lots of interesting stuff as a musician. I mean, I, I haven't even brought up the fact that you were in Full House. I mean, you're you're a member of Jesse and the Rippers, right? But it's it's interesting as we're talking. We've been talking for maybe an hour at this point. It just doesn't seem as important to talk about. Like I, I could <laughs> we could talk about Jafria all day long, but I, I find this so important, so in the moment that I almost don't want to distract from what we're discussing right now. It, it seems like you're really doing incredible stuff. Well, I appreciate that, brother. But I, I will wax poetic for anyone that knows Jafria. Um, David Glenn Isley is still a very good friend, wonderful talent, supporter of of, uh, um, of what we're doing, and I love the guy like a brother. I wish we could do more. I've I've invited him to when we were doing uh, benefits to come out, but um, he wasn't able. But I couldn't love David Glenn Isley anymore. And in fact, when I worked with Steve Perry. Um, a long time ago is and, and he uh he loved david glenn isley and of course at that point everyone's kind of criticizing dave because they said oh you know you sound just like uh you know steve perry um and steve perry liked that and i told it to dave and he had he was grinning from ear to ear also um david sykes the bass player from silk and steel the record that i did 1986 another dear friend who's a supporter wonderful guy wonderful musician who ended up playing in Boston, the band Boston for many years. And he's up in Northern California, Dave's in, um, in LA. So, you know, I, you know, I, I, I really love those guys, but at a whole different level now. Um, we just met each other at that point. And Dave sort of gave me my break. He's the one that's, you know, you know stood up for me. They kind of had somebody in mind and I had taken the whole week off to audition and it was like, and, and they said, oh, sorry, bro, but we got someone. I said, man, I, I, I took the whole week off and, and I learned all these songs note for note. And they gave me a shot. And, and so Dave is the one that, you know, you know, got me in through that, which led to Gene Simmons and, um, you know, Chuck Wright, still a very good friend who's the bass player from house of lords who was in quiet riot um 
him and I did a lot of records together in the 90s, including records with Pat Torpy from uh, Mr. Big. Those records are called Odd Man Out. Very proud of those records. We did a record with a singer named Philip Bardowell called Magdalene, and then another band with him called Chaos is the Poetry with Greg Bissonette. Then I got to do, uh, you know, um, also, yeah, we, Ken Mary was, who was in House of Lords. He was on, you know, some of those records, incredible drummer, incredible friend. Ken and I've done zillion of, zillions of things together. He's a great producer, engineer, and has a world-class studio in um, Phoenix. So, uh, you know, I, you know, it's all part of the journey. Yeah. Um, and I, I am very much focused in on the present, but I don't, I don't have a problem, you know, going back and, and I was, you know, uh, you know, uh, thinking about the positive things. I, I don't have any bitterness or anything, uh, about any of that stuff. And if there is, I won't talk about it. Cause it's just, I don't want to, <laughs> right. it's, it's just, you know, it's not, there's, it's pointless. You know what I mean? Cause there's always three sides to every stories, you know, this side, that side and the truth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Does it amaze you the level of fanaticism that Full House still has? They, they, well, it seems to only grow. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, John Stamos is a very good friend of mine. And that's what made the show so great because it really was like a family. Dave Coulier is a friend. Um, you know, Bob Saget's a friend and Jody Sweeten and Candace and and um, the, the creator, Jeff Franklin, all of them, they're, they're, it, we're still all in touch and still friends. But when I was in Pakistan, that trip in 2010, I'm in this room with some of the, the best musicians in Pakistan and it's late night and um, we're talking this, that, and the other. And uh, I don't know how Stamos's name came up, but he, he always seems to rear up somehow. <laughs> but I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, Sun Studio or when the, at Graceland, he's the narrator, uh, Stamos. That's right. That's right. Uh, there. But, you know, uh, but, you know, so this guy, Areeb Azar, one of the great treasures, uh, 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 social activist musician in Pakistan, his sister who has Down syndrome loves John Stamos and full house and the whole room with these great musicians were just like buzzing that that they were sitting with a ripper they just couldn't believe it i mean that was they they, they you know they they thought guns and road you know because i'd work with slash and all these guys they thought that was cool but to be a ripper was a whole other level because they thought that the show had these good values that showed you know like you know like a muslim value these men taking care of these you know the the daughters and the nieces and uh and and they just you know uh really resonated with that so um i had this her name was umema who was the one with the down syndrome and the, the friend of um, or the sister of my friend arib and i had her make a message for stamos and so she did and i i think it might even not sure where it is now but anyway so uh i played it for john and he's just like he couldn't believe it and so he made a message for umema and i brought it back and played it for her and oh, how that, cool. she was so incredibly happy um and then we did the jimmy fallon show and i remember you know uh that was i guess one of their highest rated shows i you know with Jesse and the rippers i was second to justin timberlake or something i, I don't I, all that works but jimmy was so cool and um i just said hey I, I walked up to him and i said jimmy man i just want to thank you for making the world laugh and he's like oh i can't believe a ripper man just told me that you know i mean so um you know it's probably a little, little bit of a gag in there but you know that's cool i mean i I've, I've made peace with all of it because in working with the kids it, you know, I'm, I'm over there. There's no places really. I mean, there's, there is kind of a social scene, but I, I kind of, I stay on the down low and I work on my own projects, reading, writing, uh, music, guitar things and all that kind of stuff. So I've, I've written so many songs and whatnot. That's how the Nick Cave thing came about. I never would have done that if I wasn't over there doing this. Right. Um, so, uh, um, you know, and then John rallied up the Rippers and we did a benefit in LA. And so, you know, the Rippers are, are you know, uh, supporters of Miraculous Love Kids. And so um, I'm grateful for all of that. You know, everything has, I mean, there was a while where I kind of resented it and I didn't want to talk about, you know, this, that, and the other. 
you know, to me, it's just embrace it. You know, you've got X amount of time. Do you want to spend it on resentment and bitterness? Or do you want to, you want to spend it on joy, creativity, beauty, wonder, healing? And that's where I elect. Well, and you said it earlier. It's the journey. It's all what, what, what got you right here. One final note on Full House. It, it, it's that wholesomeness. It's that wide-eyed wholesomeness that the show projects that still connects. I, my daughter is 15 years old. And she's watched all the episodes from start to finish more than once. And I, I, I wondered in my head, doesn't that seem dated to a modern teenage girl? No. She lo- I, I mean, I got to play with little Richard. I met uh, Annette Funicello from, you know, the, those 60s movies and, and the woman that was on Lost in Space, uh, June Lockhart, she, yeah. and, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, and, and hanging out with little Richard was just unbelievable. I mean, he was so cool. I was asking him about Jimi Hendrix. I mean, I'm uh, very fascinated by the whole enterprise of music. And so when you find some of those um, like little Richard who are really open and uh, willing to share, you know, stories, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I actually, when I was, excuse me, when I was playing with Nancy Sinatra, <laughs> we were playing in Austria. Name dropper. Oh, well, yeah, uh, you know, but, but it's, it's true, believe it or not. Um, uh, and it was with Gilby Clark. Clem Burke from Blondie. So Gilby from Guns N' Roses, Clem Burke from Blondie, Don Randy, who was one of the Wrecking Crew guys. It was a super cool band. This guy named Tom Lilly on bass who played with Jefferson Starship and he had a band with Mick Fleetwood. So it was really cool dudes. And um, we were in Austria playing an Elvis festival. So it was basically anything, I don't know, some rich Austrian guy decided to, to put this thing on. So he flew out, you know, Nancy and Elvis were friends. They did a movie together. So, and then Joe Esposito and all of the Memphis mafia guys were there and James Burton who, you know, played guitar with Elvis and Ron Tutt, the drummer, the original drummer, uh, DJ Fontana. Wow. Uh, I think Bill Black was there. I don't think, um, the, 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 the Jordanaires, because Elvis had like four different vocal groups. I mean, it was like anyone that could be there was there. And so it was so phenomenal. And on the way back, um, after that miraculous week, uh, you know, in, in, in Vienna, um, there, was a, there was something with the weather. So we had to land in London. So we land in London. Hey, that's cool by us, you know, a night in London. We're all right. Uh, Phil Spector was there. And yeah, so Phil invited us all to dinner and he sits down and he says, okay, everybody, I'm just, I'm here tonight. Just have a nice night with you. And I'm not talking about myself. And then for the next three hours, he just proceeded to about Phil Spector. Now I'm, I'm intrigued by this because I know that this is the only time this is going to happen. Right. And you're, and you're a student of music kind of history. Like, this is, this is, he's a touchstone to so much and we, we know so much about him publicly. I, I'm sure it'd be fascinating. Well, you know, this is obviously before the, you know, incident that he was involved in. But, uh, well, it turns out that he had a thing for, for Nancy. And, um, and so um, uh, that's, that's why he invited us all. Anyway, and everyone left and it was just me and him. So I'm sitting there talking to him about, so, you know, how, how did you get that snare drum on Imagine? You know, he's like, oh yeah, well, Alan White had this, you know, you know, put a wallet here and we put it, you know, he described it in detail and God, I don't remember all the details because it was just such a fever dream. Yeah. And then he I'm did sure. um, this weird Leonard, I'm a, I love Leonard Cohen, but he did probably, <laughs> Leonard's got a few albums that are, are, are not um, as good as say some of his other ones. But one of them that is probably the most questionable was his album, Death of a Ladies Man which he did with, with Phil Spector. And, and I asked him about that and he told me about the process. So he was very forthcoming and very generous and all the things that I, you know, I had to ask him. I think he was enjoying that there was someone, he was having a renaissance. He was in, a, he was in London producing a band called Star Sailor. I and heard that yeah, British band, right? Yeah, and then he was lined up to produce Coldplay and U2 yeah. and he was, he, he was on the comeback trail. And then, um, you know, he had, uh, you know, that guy was his worst own worst enemy yep. and in a real American tragedy. Matt Sorum, who I used to have a production company with, tells a story uh, about him and Phil. It's just 
harrowing. Of course, we, we, him and I uh, had our time of shenanigans. Um, surprised we, we got through it and did as much work as we did because uh, we, 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 we managed to, uh, you know, do our work and then go down the rabbit hole of that whole stuff. And, uh, but um, yeah, like you said, it's this, it's this mosaic um, and, you know, and each part of it, you know, has its, you know, moments of, you know, you know, grace and, and it's moments of uh, um, disgrace. <laughs> so even in, 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 in Bulgaria, I mean, at that time there was just, it was magical and it was mystical and it was de debauchical. <laughs> I don't think there's such a word. We just created a new there word. Is, yeah, there is now. It, it's funny because you are such a student and practitioner uh, of rock. I mean, I feel like any of the artists we talked about in the past hour, we could spend another hour talking about whether it's Alice Cooper or Nick Cave or yeah. Jimmy Page or, or Guns N' Roses or Tom Morello. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by all those guys. And I love hearing all that background stuff. I'm not a musician, but I love hearing the different techniques, like you mentioned, throwing a wallet under the snare or whatever. I love the yeah. behind the scenes stuff that, that always <laughs> fascinates me. That's why I love well, watching know. rock by rock documentaries. I, can't, I just watched the Bee Gees one this weekend. I love it. How was that? It was awesome. It made me feel yeah. good about life. Yeah. It just made me feel, I mean, you're, you're, you're all positive energy. I mean, it just made me feel good. I'm going to have to check that one out. Um, you know, I, lo I love the Bee Gees. I mean, who, who, who doesn't, I mean, there's, there's, there's several Bee Gees. The early Bee Gees were like, they were like on par with the Beatles. Those first couple of records are it's like pure pop. Yeah. I mean, just incredible. Craze fit, fit and Kirk and, and um, oh, I think New know. York mining disaster is a, a tremendous, oh, yeah. all of that stuff is just phenomenal. Even the kinks they're, they're, they had records that were in that whole period with Beach Boys and Hendrix and Dylan. I mean, it was just uh, the who, I mean, phenomenal stuff. My first concert was the Beach Boys, or not the Beach Boys, was the Bee Gees. Wow. At, at Chicago Stadium. It was the Spirits Having Flown Tour. I went with my parents. Well, then you think it, yeah, well, then, you know, after they had that thing, and then they had another phase, which I'm not as familiar with before. That was the phase, post kind of Beatle phase, but pre Saturday Night Fever phase. Right. And that, that was, like was the, the main course phase. That was like when they started cranking out the big top 40 hits in America, like Jive Talking and Nights on Broadway. That's, that yeah, of. that's the Saturday Night Fever, right? Isn't it? Well, yeah. that was before Saturday Night Fever. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, you, 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 you're, you're more up on the Bee Gees. I, I, I'm going to have to watch. We've gone down a horrible rabbit hole. We've got to bring it back, Lanny. Uh, let's bring it back to the Miraculous <laughs> Love Kids. We, we've talked so much about what you've done overseas and what you've done for these girls. And I mean, you hear that cliche, that metaphor of people who run toward the fire. You're that guy. And I don't think people know they are those people until they experience it, until they're tested, until they're put in that situation. Exactly. I think you learn that about yourself. But we've talked so much about what you've done. What we haven't really talked about is how we can help as, as we're listening. What, what can we do to, to help these efforts? Because I, anyone listening, anyone watching is probably thinking, oh, this is, this is extraordinary. And, oh, my gosh, what can I do? Well, um, please, you know, you can go to uh, the YouTube and watch um, Sweet Dreams by the Miraculous Love Kids. So cool. Uh, and a, a very haunting version of it, too. Oh, uh, well, thanks. You know, and I'll tell you, um, everybody sent their tracks in without hearing each other. And we did not have to do a lot of editing. This That's is when impressive. I- I, I know. So when, so when, when I actually first heard it, when Sarmad Gafour, who's my partner in Pakistan, brought it up and there was these two guitars playing, we, we, we muted Tom because we were going to use Tom for a separate section. We did edit that in a different place because there was only a certain amount of bars, but it was this very like spacey legato esoteric guitar. And I thought that was Vicky. And then there was another one that's just ripping and I thought that was Tom, but it was the other way around. That's awesome. Wayne was doing the esoteric space, psychedelic, and Vicky was just, you know, going for it. And then Tom comes in, you know, with his Tomisms that are second to none. And so we were very, very, very fortunate to, you know, get everything because it, it was a beautiful mess when we, and it still a little bit is, but it, it's, it's, there's a, there's a charm to that. And then Jelly Bean got to do her little, you know, little thing with Tom during that first little solo, like the little kind of her little parts, like, like a David Gilmore kind of part. But anyway, so, you know, YouTube, uh, Sweet Dreams, Miraculous Love Kids, you know, check out Love and Mercy. Um, 
Miraculous Love Kids with Brian Wilson. And then um, if anyone uh, you know, feels the spirit to, uh, to help out, um, they can visit our website. So that's MiraculousLoveKids.org, M-I-R-A-C-L-O-U-S-K-I-D-S. Is that it? Miraculous Love Kids? We, we can find it. That, that's a pretty, pretty easy one to Google. No need to put you, put you in the spelling bee here. Oh, my God. I, I do want to say while we're on the topic of the Bengals, that first album, All Over the Place, I still love that. Yeah. They're, they're, they were always a great jangly yeah. pop band. That Hero Takes a Fall, yeah. James. I love that stuff from the first album. Sorry, I digress. No, man. I, 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 I don't get to talk about the Bengals that much. Well, it's too bad because we should because they're, they're, they're really good. And Vicky is a, is a stellar human being. And I want to praise. I'm, I, I like, I'm a praise singer as opposed to... A, a criticizer, you know, I'd rather spend the time in praise mode. I mean, sometimes you got to criticize because there are things that need to be, you got to be critical of. And that's a whole other conversation about, you know, the amount of money that's been spent in Afghanistan for very little and uh, of taxpayer, American taxpayer money and very little of it, if any of it has gone to, you know, the, the, the poor and to the kids that are living in the trenches. So, um, but in, in general, when it comes to music, I'd much rather wax poetic about what moves my soul, right? I mean, who wants to sit there and, you know, ah, nah, no, no. I used to be that guy. I know? was about to say, I used to be that guy too. And I think you just- You know what it was? It was a kind of jealousy. There was kind of an ego, like, oh, I'm better than that. I'm as good. It's like, forget all that stuff, man. We're all here for X amount of time, whether you're this incredible, you know, unknown person in Boise, Idaho, or whether you're Bruce Springsteen, your life matters, you know, and, you know, success is fleeting. Like life is fleeting. When people talk about, oh, just trying to survive. I go, look at brother, sister, none of us survive, man. Let's thrive while we're here do as much good as we can, wherever we can, however we can, to whomever we can. And it's really, you're ultimately doing that good for yourself too. I mean, that's really the, the you know, the, the miraculous thing that I've discovered in these, uh, you know, uh, difficult areas of the earth. So that when I come back here, you know, I'm able to be, you know, more present. And as you can tell, I'm extremely um, uh, enthusiastic about, you know, what's happening. And uh, although, you know, like I said earlier, my heart breaks, my soul awakes, you know, it's kind of like what Jesus said, you got to be sly as a serpent, gentle as a dove, you got to be embodying contradictory emotions. And so, yeah, it's a spiritual journey. It's a musical journey. It's a cultural journey. It's a mystical journey. It's all of those things. And all of us can experience it. Um, but you just have to open yourself up to it. And you got to be willing to, you know, get your hands dirty and you got to be willing to get uncomfortable because let me tell you, my brother, it is sometimes very uncomfortable. So, but when you get through it, you're like, yeah, bring it on. What's next? <laughs> I love it. Again, miraculouslovekids.org. Uh, yeah. I, we couldn't ask for a better story, a better message, a, a better organization as we head into the holidays. And we're all thinking about doing right by one another. So thank you for sharing your stories. Brother James, thank you so much. And uh, to all your listeners, I, I wish them well and happy holidays and be good to one another, be good to yourself. And, um, you know, we're all in this together, man. That's it.